begin uh, this day's look at the uh, the Battle of Chickamauga, um, and um, and we are um, are going to um, uh, for some of you all who were with us um, last evening, we're going to um, in a degree pick up where we uh, we left off last night. Although hopefully those of you who were um, with me uh, quickly said, "Wait a minute, Ogden, we're a long way away from where we were last night." Um, but um, this story is, um, is one of, um, of multi-parts, um, and as you um, uh, heard, uh, heard me say last night, um, what we really need to have is multiple of these tours going on in many different places on the battlefield to, tr to really try to get at the sense of just how complex this um, whole thing is. Um, it, on September the 19th, it is events in this area that are, um, are going to be, uh, be responsible um, for what uh, will then subsequently unfold during the course of that um, Saturday, now 150 uh, years ago. Um, we are, um, are going to start out here and leave this spot in just a couple of minutes. We're going to, uh, to walk north um, up onto the, uh, to the edge of Reeds Bridge Road um, and, um, and, then, um, and then back into uh, to this area. This will be, um, as far as walking goes, um, a shorter one certainly than the second um, uh, last night. Um, but um, we'll look at some of the, uh, the key um, uh, acts or areas associated with this um, early morning. Uh, we are um, uh, right now, right near one of the principal landmarks um, on the, uh, the battlefield, and I'll say a little more about it in just a moment. Jay's Steam Sawmill is just up, um, up here, a very short distance. Uh, just down the road from uh, us is the, uh, the very large Youngblood Farm. And um, uh, on the evening of September the, uh, the 18th, as darkness settled over the battlefield and the troops that um, Braxton Bragg had been maneuvering on the 18th began to, um, to, to bivouac uh, for the, uh, the night, uh, so did the, uh, the cavalry of Nathan Bedford Forest Command up in this area. Their various elements and patrols began to be pulled back in, um, and uh, John Pegram's brigade, um, commanded um, both by Pegram himself and J.J. Um, Morrison of the 1st Georgia Cavalry at that particular point, uh, will uh, move into a, a bivouac on the other side of uh, Chickamauga Creek down beyond um, Alexander's Bridge. But as they do, they will deploy the 1st uh, the Georgia Cavalry to cover the rear uh, of the Confederate column that had, um, had crossed at Reed's Bridge. And at well after dark, the 1st Georgia Cavalry will ride up um, this, uh, this road from the south and will begin to look in the dark for a place to, um, to deploy um, a, um, a picket line. One of the soldiers in that, um, that command is a fellow by the name of uh, Shropshire, um, and um, he will um, later leave an account of, um, of that um, uh, action. In the early part of the night, the 18th, our regiment, with Company G a short distance in advance, was cautiously moving on the road leading to the steam sawmill, um, seeking an advanced position as possible for the purpose of establishing a picket or skirmish line for the night. On reaching some 300 yards from the sawmill, Company G was fired into by the enemy from ambush at short range, but their aim being too high, hence done but little serious injury, though several men and horses were wounded. This firing into Company G caused a halt. Colonel Morrison, having obtained his object, fell uh, back about 100 yards, halted, half-wheeled into line, counted off by fours, Number one, two, and three dismounting. Number four holding the three horses beside his own. All cavalrymen understand what counting off by fours mean and how eagerly that number was sought by some. The horses were uh, sent a short distance in rear and the dismounted men were formed into line facing in the direction from which we had just come. We stood in the line, the balance of the night. No reliefs, no lying down, nor sleeping, 
but stood wide-eyed and ears alert to any and all sounds. We were not disturbed by the enemy during the night. Um, they deploy um, across the other road to our south um, a, a little ways, probably a couple hundred yards. Uh, no specific landmark is, um, is given for, uh, for where they um, deploy. They spread that skirmish line out um, across the road facing up in, um, in this direction. And then those men, um, of, um, in particular Company G of the 1st Georgia Cavalry, um, spend that, um, that very nervous night having had that little encounter with some Federals somewhere up in, um, in this area. Um, who were those Federals? What were they doing here? Let's go find out. Um, it was actually a portable sawmill. It was a, um, a steam uh, firebox and boiler um, and, um, and uh, actual uh, driving wheel and, and uh, piston um, on a, um, a wheel um, uh, wagon like uh, like structure um, which drove a um, large flywheel which powered a belt that, which then powered the actual um, sawmill itself so it was capable of being moved we don't know a great deal about it uh, how large it was um, there's one story in an, uh, an old family here that when the mill or sawmill or when the board engine was moved across Reed's bridge that it was um, heavy enough that they had to reinforce um, Reed's bridge. Um, makes, uh, makes some sense, uh, but we, uh, we don't know as, as much as at least I would like to, uh, to know about it. Why it was here exactly, um, we don't know. It certainly is cutting um, logs into, um, to, uh, into uh, timber or into lumber, um, and there are a couple of places on the battlefield where we will subsequently learn that there are felled trees or the tops of trees. One down by the, uh, the Brock uh, Farm uh, down, on down Brotherton Road, another just a little bit to the west of us. Also, there was a field here at the time larger than the one that you see presently. It was an L-shaped field, um, uh, a backwards L-shaped field, the north south element of it ran parallel to um, the Jace Mill Road that we are standing on um, and the uh, western projection, the furthest part of it, um, was, um, was sticking out you know, just directly in front of where we are right now. So if you kind of can envision um, a backwards L with the, uh, the, the base, um, the point of the base sticking westward in, in ahead of you, um, that's what uh, the field would have looked like. Um, it would have been roughly three times the size of this field um, right here. Later, as it um, gets lighter, um, I'll be able to show you a few more of those landmarks. The field is described as having stumps and head-high brush um, in it. Only part of the um, western projection was, um, was cultivated. So there was a large open area um, here at the, um, at the time. And that's going to come into um, to our story as we move on. Uh, the mill itself stood right, um, right down in here um, somewhere, again being a portable sawmill. It's a, it's a, it doesn't have much footprint. It was located right here because if you can look in uh, where my light is sweeping back and forth, there is a spring right up in here. Now as with most springs, um, now 150 years later, they don't flow anywhere near like they did um, in 1863. Today, we pump so much more water out of the earth from much deeper that the water table is literally dropped and springs, um, the water just doesn't get up to feed some springs. So this spring does not flow like it did, but there are some spring type plants um, in it. And um, this spring um, power provided the water to keep the boiler filled to make the steam to drive the engine to drive the, uh, the sawmill. So that's why it is located right here. Um, and the, uh, the Jay's Mill Road. It was at this intersection um, on the um, late afternoon of September the 18th where the head of the uh, column of troops of the provisional division under Bushrod Johnson, having during the course of late morning and early and mid-afternoon 
push Robert H.G. Minty, small brigade of cavalry back um, from the, uh, the east to the west across Chickamauga Creek at Reed's Bridge, having seized the bridge, having replanked the bridge to return it to, um, to service, uh, joined by uh, John Bell Hood, um, a, who is a major general, um, and with um, Bragg having learned that Hood would soon arrive, uh, in the final version of his, uh, his order, had designated um, that Bushrod Johnson's column, which would cross the creek at Reed's Bridge, um, would fall under the command of John Bell Hood um, once Hood arrived on the scene. And so the uh, order as written was Johnson's, open parenthesis, Hood's, close parenthesis, um, division will, um, the, um, and so when Major General John Bell Hood, just fresh off the train from, um, from Virginia, cheered by the men of his old brigade as he rode through them um, towards the head of the column. When he rode up to, uh, to Bushrod Russ Johnson, um, immediately, having never spoken with Bragg, having never heard what the big plan is, says, I'm Major General um, uh, John Bell Hood. You, Brigadier General Bushrod Russ Johnson, are now under my command. The column will cross the creek at Reed's Bridge, come up to this intersection, um, and uh, make a left-hand turn. Because the orders say, upon crossing at Reed's Bridge, we'll sweep up the Chickamauga towards Lee and Gordon's Mill. Where is Lee and Gordon's Mill? About four miles to our south southwest in that direction. And probably with the guidance of um, information from a soldier from the local area, because uh, learning that there are companies in his army raised here in Catoosa and Walker County, Braxton Bragg has had some of those men detailed as guides. Most famously, um, that's going to be one of the, uh, the Brotherton boys. Um, but others um, were serving in that same capacity as well. Um, and perhaps with um, an inquiry, um, well, what's the shortest way, or what's the way to Lee and Gordon's Mill from here? That young soldier who may well have carried umpteen bags of, um, of corn to be, uh, be ground said, turn left right here. Um, Bushrod Johnson, in the course of the discussion, proposes then turning right onto what we know today as Brotherton Road. Um, and if this column had gone either westward on the Reeds Bridge Road, road in front of you, uh, or turned right onto Brotherton Road, it may well have put that column of roughly 7,000 Confederates astride the Lafayette Road by dark on September the um, 18th, and thereby cut that um, uh, major artery for the Union Army back to Chattanooga. But that's not what happens. Bushrod John, or excuse me, John Bell Hood orders the column to continue south on uh, Jay's Mill Road. And one regiment of Gregg's brigade um, is spread out in front of the, uh, the column, and they advance southward. Now, they're crossing at Reed's Bridge, they're turning south, will have the res uh, effect of forcing John Thomas Wilder to give up his position at um, uh, Alexander's Bridge, but it will uh, cause Wilder then to fall back in front of this advancing column and stop them short of the Lafayette Road, just to the east of the Vineyard Field area, um, and in the area where we were last night um, at the, uh, the start of our tour, the area of the gate where we turned to go down into um, the Dalton and Fedford Sword area, um, and then uh, that final line that I pointed out, um, at least to my group, as we concluded the, uh, the walk last evening. Um, so this column, um, led by Greg's Brigade, um, and then the others will go south on the Jays Mill Road. Now, despite the, um, the military organization of, um, of this column, uh, it is not 
um, I have uh, no military column, uh, has everybody um, completely, compactly organized and together. As the columns turn south, you got all of uh, the trains and those who are lagging behind and trying to catch up. Um, and in this case, um, since there had been some fighting to gain control of Reed's Bridge, some of the medical personnel of Bushrod Johnson's Provisional Division had set up um, small field hospitals along the Reed's Bridge Road. But now, with that fighting over, limited casualties there, and the main column pushing southward, those medical personnel are amongst those at the tail end of the column trying to, um, to catch up. And so well after the very end of the column, uh, of the organized column pushes south, you would have had small numbers of wagons, um, individual soldiers, small groups of soldiers, and at least one of these uh, brigade uh, medical detachments moving to catch up with the, uh, the main column. Um, so we can envision the main column turning southward, but then remember that trickle of other things along behind. Also, since wagons carry supplies and supplies are consumed, there were empty wagons also returning this way and going back across Reed's Bridge for a new load of, um, of supplies as well. So you've got some two-way traffic going through this intersection um, at dark and even after um, dark. So remember that um, uh, action going on here. And we're going to walk up um, Reed's Bridge Road now a little ways. Um, please be very careful of your footing. We're going to stay on this side of the, uh, the pavement. We're going to walk along the grass. Um, and so just watch um, where you step. Virginia, there is more standardization and regularization, um, and, and you've got you know, Fredericksburg, the, the clock tower on the, the, uh, the courthouse building, uh, that was a, a community institution to provide a, a standardized guide uh, of time. So, you know, that, but out here, a lot less population density, um, the, the number of newspapers, while far greater than normally acknowledged, are, are still not the density in, as in, um, in Virginia, Maryland, and Pennsylvania. Um, so you, you get a, yeah, you know, um, what y'all might want to do is pass me and um, uh, stand over here and turn around and look back. Um, the, um, the other um, reason for that is then I'll, only, I'll be the only one really looking into the, uh, to the blue lights. So, um, Morning, Dave. Morning, Dave. Oh, not too bad. I figured if all you guys could do it, all you old parts could get out here, I could make it too. I resemble that remark. Okay. <laughs> um, we have walked up here to, um, to this um, uh, cluster of monuments that um, does not see a great deal of um, a visitation by, uh, by true um, uh, battlefield visitors. Um, of course, the hardcore um, do, um, but um, your average tour, um, uh, even when it is a couple of days of length, does not normally allow um, a visit to, uh, to this site. But this cluster of monuments is to the regiment of the Brigade of the Reserve Corps, commanded by um, Dan McCook. This brigade um, of four regiments and an attachment um, the 69th Ohio um, has perhaps had the, uh, the longest, but maybe not the most difficult, march to uh, be here now uh, in the valley of West Chickamauga Creek. They had been stationed in the Nashville area, um, and uh, Gordon Granger had been ordered to begin to gather some elements of the Reserve Corps and push them forward. Um, and this, this uh, Dan McCook was ordered to bring his brigade. They marched from just south of Nashville, uh, through Franklin, Columbia, down into Alabama, go through Huntsville, Scott, um, and on the way to, uh, to Scottsboro, this circuitous march did allow Dan McCook and some of the men of his brigade to extract a measure of vengeance for the death of Dan's brother Robert in 1862 because they marched through a small community along the Memphis and Charleston Railroad called Tank, because there was a water tank there. Right near Tank lived Frank Gurley, 
an officer in the 4th Alabama Cavalry, uh, who, um, operating in a somewhat irregular fashion um, in North Alabama and um, Southern Tennessee in 1862, had encountered a small federal party um, of a couple of ambulances and um, a few others um, on, the, on a road near Winchester, Tennessee in 1862. And as a result of that encounter, uh, Robert McCook had been, uh, been killed. Now, you might notice I have somewhat chosen my words carefully because to this day, this remains a controversial um, subject. Certainly, um, the McCook family and many of the, um, uh, the Federals will um, uh, relate this incident as the murder of uh, uh, Robert McCook. Uh, but if you read the Confederate accounts, as um, Gurley and his detachment begin to take possession of this um, the Federal detachment, the, um, well, there are shots fired, and in the course of those shots fired, Robert McCook will be struck, mortally wounded, and die from the effects. But they'll mar um, Dan McCook's brigade will march um, through the tank area, um, and a detachment is sent specifically to Frank Gurley's um, large farm plantation, um, and there, all except a couple of slave quarters, which were still occupied by some of Gurley's slaves, they remove Gurley's uh, plantation from the face of the earth. Uh, they will then march on to Stevenson, Bridgeport, and come in along the Nashville and Chattanooga Railroad to Chattanooga. Uh, and they are part of the eventual three brigades of the Reserve Corps that Gordon Granger gets gathered together and positioned astride the uh, Federal Road guarding its pass through Missionary Ridge at Rossville Gap. Um, and that is where um, they have been for the last couple of days. And then on the 18th of September, as Bragg's advance began, and as Minty, um, who that morning uh, was positioned, uh, his main body camped just on the other side of Reed's Bridge. Some troops camped on this side. But that morning on the 18th, his patrols had gone out, encountered approaching Confederates. He had then immediately transitioned to the delay, but he also did the most important thing an officer in his position um, should, could, and must do. He reported. reported. As soon as he made contact with advancing Confederates, he immediately began to send messages back to Thomas Crittenden and William Stark Rosecrans, the, Confeder the Confederates in large numbers are advancing up from the south, southeast and east um, towards me guarding this crossing of Chickamauga Creek at Breed's Bridge. As he transitions to the delay and begins to cost the Confederates time by having to deploy, Minty will also request um, assistance. When he first forced uh, Bushrod Johnson to deploy in the Peavine Creek Valley, he could count 13 battle flags. Knowing that he had just under 1,000 men, he knew he was outnumbered. Well, his request for reinforcements will bring him to regiments from Wilder, which he'll use to guard downstream um, crossings, but he continued to request additional troops. And in late afternoon, Gordon Granger will respond. And the assembly is sounded in the camp of uh, Dan McCook's brigade up near Rossville, and uh, Dan McCook's brigade will begin to march south uh, towards the Reeds Bridge area. He will turn off of the, uh, the Lafayette Road on uh, one of the branches of this Reeds Bridge Road as it approaches the Lafayette Road and move out towards this Reeds Bridge area and begins to approach here just at, um, at dark. Um, he um, is told that he is going out to support um, Robert Minty's um, brigade. But as he arrives uh, out here, he will um, uh, not find Minty's brigade. Because Minty in late afternoon, forced back across the creek at Reed's Bridge, um, had broken contact with the enemy, had ridden out to the Lafayette Road, turned south and rode down to, um, to Crittenden, where Crittenden was at Lee and Gordon's Mill, 
and report it to um, Crittenden and Rosecrans, um, whose response was, what are you doing here? Um, and even more importantly, where is the enemy? And Minty's response was, the last time I saw them, they were crossing Chickamauga Creek at Reed's Bridge. Not, of course, exactly those words, um, but that certainly was the meaning of what he um, related. By having broken contact and withdrawn to the south, what is he just left open, potentially, for the, uh, for the Confederates? <coughs> uh, so Minty has departed and ridden southward, and into this area, just at dark, arrives at the head of Dan McCook's brigade. Because he had had such a circuitous mar route to march to get here, uh, and because he was marching essentially by himself, Dan McCook was concerned that he um, uh, might be ambushed somewhere along the way, and I'm talking about somewhere in Tennessee or North <laughs> Alabama. He had impromptuly created his own scout formation, gathering animals from various sources, and using a few spare animals that um, Battery I, 2nd Illinois Line Artillery had. Some of his more reliable men had been mounted um, and to provide him a mounted scouting force or screening force on his advance. He has continued that ad hoc formation and on the afternoon of the uh, 18th, his advance here is led by that, um, that, that small scout force. As they arrive into this area, they push just ahead, and what do they find trickling through that intersection up there? Confederates. Confederates. The tail end of the main column. The main column has gone south, but what's following along behind? Some wagons going southward, an occasional wagon going back um, to, uh, towards Reed's Bridge and the other side, um, and the um, uh, the, uh, just the, um, some of these medical detachments and other Confederates trying to catch up with the, uh, the main column. Um, and they begin to, uh, to round them up. Uh, this is reported to Dan McCook, and Dan McCook, um, having found Minty gone, will begin to deploy his brigade facing where there is evidence of Confederates. And he will deploy across the road right here. The 86th um, Illinois, whose monument is right here, is put on the right flank of his line, um, south of the road, a couple of hundred yards. Um, right here in this area, the 52nd Ohio is deployed. They are all facing off um, in the direction we've just come from. On the other side of the road, the second uh, battery I, first Illinois, or excuse me, second Illinois light artillery, Barnett's battery, and just beyond them, the 85th Illinois. And, uh, in a second line, the attached 69th Ohio and the 125th um, Illinois. They will um, deploy skirmishers a couple of hundred yards out in front um, and most probably to the edge of the what was then the larger Jay's Mill field um, there. The scouts will continue to probe out in front. Um, and it is the, the action of those scouts that is the little skirmish or fight that Shropshire described as they rode that north, that night north, looking where to deploy their skirmish or picket line. Um, late at night, some accounts put it as late as midnight, that little clash. Um, the, um, but it is contact between the scouts and the, um, the advancing um, First Georgia men looking to establish their picket or skirmish line for the night. The scouts also will begin to round up Confederates at that intersection. Because this is the tail end of the column, there isn't an MP detachment or anything stationed at that intersection to tell Confederates to go south, and some of those Confederates just continue westward right into the uh, federal uh, lines and they are captured. This will include much of the medical detachment of McDair's brigade, a brass band complete with horns, uh, uh, and others. 
and it also includes a field grade officer who is particularly incensed at having been taken from possession of by the uh, Federals. They will be interrogated by Dan McCook and others, and Dan McCook will begin to get the sense because the medical personnel will only say that they are associated with McNair's Brigade. Dan McCook starts getting the sense that Evander McNair's Brigade is somewhere not too far in his front. Remember that for a little bit later on. Um, Dan McCook men will try to bivouac as best they can. That little contact with the First Georgia disturb their, um, their rest. They sleep on their arms um, that night. But as the morning begins to approach, so too do some of the Confederates. But that <laughs> same night, the, um, the Federals here, who had marched down from McFarland Spring at Rossville Gap, some of the men begin to look for something. They've, looked, they've um, lifted their canteens to find that they are low. The drought of the last year is causing water sources to, uh, to dry up or to flow less um, vigorously. And so a search for water begins. And guess where they find some water? The small spring that feeds Jay's Mill. Um, it is just outside of the picket line of Dan McCook's brigade. But individual soldiers and eventually detachments, water detachments, begin to filter down to um, the, uh, the spring to fill canteens for those individual soldiers or for, um, the, uh, for the men of companies and, um, and regiments. The um, uh, McCook's men will, um, will, as I said, spend that uh, relatively nervous uh, night here facing off in that direction. And as dawn approaches, having had contact with the uh, Federals um, late at night, the 1st Georgia Cavalry, reporting that up their chain, will prompt the uh, movement into this area of the rest of John Pegram's brigade now coming under the command of the just arrived Henry B. Davidson uh, and the other regiments of the brigade will ride up from the uh, from the south. The first Georgia cavalrymen will also begin to scout um, around as well and soon there will be some shots fired um, just off to uh, Dan McCook's right front and south uh, east of this position. This will prompt Dan McCook to begin a reorientation from facing to the east to facing to the south. He will order the skirmish line, which had faced off to the east, to basically conduct a large white right wheel and wheel to face to the south. The end of the skirmish line probably reaching all the way to the tip of a bend in the Chickamauga Creek where Reed's Ford is located. Um, and the individual regiments began to turn southward as well. Oh, um, oh, late at night, Dan McCook had been reinforced by the arrival of a second brigade of the Reserve Corps detachment. John Mitchell's brigade of Stedman's division had arrived and they had bivouacked overnight astride the road and now they too are being reoriented to face to the south as the number of shots rising in the woods um, to the south increases. Now there's a great deal of dispute amongst the various members of the brigade exactly how they reorient and which, to, um, which order the regiments are um, uh, as they, uh, they do, but the key thing is that Dan McCook is now reorienting to face to the, um, uh, to the south. Um, that includes his battery, but at the same time, Dan McCook is doing this. He's also doing something else that is going to be key for what's about to happen. Um, now, I'm going, I need to slip through you all. Uh, what we're going to do is, once it is clear and safe, we are going to safely cross the, uh, the Reeds Bridge Road. Watch your footing. Forest, um, forest is just a myth.
able to contact you. You're all lined up. Good. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Doing that, I'm, I'm already out of town that weekend. So. <laughs> okay. This is the monument to the uh, the 69th Ohio. As Rosecrans had advanced, um, it had been necessary for him um, to increasingly garrison points um, in his um, his rear. And it had resulted in um, a number of units being detached from their parent um, brigades um, and left to guard um, uh, points on the railroad or caches of supplies that had been temporarily um, accumulated at a given point or um, until a reserve corps unit could come forward from somewhere in the rear and take their place. The 69th Ohio was one of those regiments. They had been relieved from that rear guard duty and were pushing forward. And on the march of Dan McCook's brigade from Bridgeport to Chattanooga, the 69th Ohio was told to, um, to go along with Dan McCook's brigade and uh, the, uh, they basically used them as the means to get them back to their parent unit. Well, on the 18th, they march out here with um, Dan McCook's brigade and overnight, as Dan McCook learned about um, this potential Confederate force in his front, um, he, uh, knowing that Reed's Bridge is there to his front, um, he decides he is going to try to take out that crossing of Chickamauga Creek. Now, in the, uh, the military, there is an unspoken rule that is almost um, a uh, complete um, uh, axiom and true um, rule. It should almost be added as one of the principles of war. If you have an attachment and you have a dirty job to do, who do you assign to do the dirty job? The attachment. And if we had a group of military officers, and later today, when officers from the 198th um, Infantry Brigade, the basic training brigade at Fort Benning, when they are here, including officers from the 1st and 2nd Battalions of the 19th United States Infantry, a regiment that fought here, um, and whose motto is the Rock of Chickamauga, um, at, get, um, if you have a chance to talk to some of those uh, officers, ask them about the experience of being an attachment to some other formation. Um, the, um, the, when I've been with Army staff rides and we get talking about this, they almost fall on the floor um, uh, laughing. Um, but Dan McCook now has conceived the idea of burning Reed's Bridge. He assigns the attached 69th Ohio to do that job. The 69th Ohio will set out um, eastward about the time that the reorientation to the south is occurring as well. And the skirmish line is turning to the south. They will move um, both down the road. Some accounts also have them moving through um, a cornfield. I suspect that as they get closer to the bridge is where they actually get off of the road, spread out and approach on a little broader front. Uh, but they arrive at um, Reed's Bridge. Um, they find um, the little evidence of Confederates around, except some evidence of Confederate pickets um, on the other side of the creek. A portion of the 69th Ohio, um, just a small detachment, will push across the creek to drive those few Confederates back. A few shots will be exchanged at the same time. Other members of the 69th Ohio um, piled some combustibles on Reed's Bridge and set those combustibles on fire to burn the bridge. The fire, um, the fires begin to uh, to burn. The uh, but the uh, men who have pushed to the other side of the creek have essentially poked a hornet's nest because camped on the other side. Um, is a, more than a full brigade of um, Confederates. And the Confederates begin to respond and start pushing troops back towards um, Reed's Bridge. 
the, um, uh, as the Confederates began to approach from the east side, uh, the uh, 69th Ohio, fearing that they may well be um, uh, out outnumbered, as indeed they are, that they themselves might be, um, be cut off, decide to pull out. They see their fires burning. It looks like they're taking, that the bridge is going to be burned. As they pull back westward, back towards Dan McCook's position here, they leave sight of smoke and flames rising off of the planks of um, Reed's Bridge. They get back to Dan McCook here and report that Reed's Bridge is burned. Um, but during this time, the skirmish, the fight between um, Dan McCook's skirmishers and the approaching 1st Georgia Cavalry has intensified. We'll talk a little bit more about that in, um, in just a few moments, uh, but um, eventually Dan McCook is going to, um, to receive an order from um, Gordon Granger to return to the main Reserve Corps position up astride the uh, Federal Road up at Rossville Gap. And with no Minty out here, no other Federals immediately in the area, what uh, McCook perceives to be a division, um, or, in, or what some of McCook's men perceives to be um, as much as a Confederate division, McCook decides to act immediately on that order to return to Rossville. Um, and hastily, the staff officers go out to tell the regimental commanders to begin to withdraw. So hastily is this order disseminated that um, they don't even pass it down through all of the, uh, the commands. And some of the regiments learn that they are withdrawing only when they see the unit on their right uh, disappear. And quickly the orders are given to move off back up the corridor of the Reeds Bridge Road. Some of the skirmishers will never be informed that they are withdrawing. And they only learn when um, the, um, uh, they are, are pushed back, as we'll hear, um, and they get back closer to where the main line should be, and there's no main line. They look up the road, and what do they see? The tail end of that column uh, moving off. Um, now, McCook's withdrawal is generally orderly. It's a little hurried. Um, but it is generally orderly. But in Battery I, 2nd Illinois Light Artillery, um, they had had enough extra animals and um, the, um, had taken possession of an extra limber. They had actually created a veterinary operation within the battery to care for the horses. They had assigned this one team and limber um, to be the veterinary vehicle for the, uh, the battery. Well, the man in charge of this is not necessarily the most reliable or um, steady soldier. As they begin to withdraw um, and the fire intensifies, um, he will whip his team into um, a, um, a gallop and go charging through the woods along the road, um, uh, actually passing most of the rest of the column and being died by all of um, his comrades as he goes um, uh, fleeing to the, uh, to the rear. But McCook's men will begin to withdraw back out towards um, uh, the Lafayette Road and Rossville. Well, in just a minute, we're going to, uh, to leave here and work our way back um, in that direction. Um, but, uh, and so we'll leave sight of these monuments, um, but um, to remember that they are here, they, they reorient it to the south, and then, under order, they are going to begin that withdrawal to the, uh, to the west. Before I pull out of here, I'll entertain any questions. When was the withdrawal? The um, it's um, it's after uh, by by the, that time it's after daylight. It's um, uh, probably 6:30. Um, oh, early on the 19th. It's early on the 19th. Yeah, it's after daylight um, by the time they actually start to uh, to withdraw. Uh -huh. Does the yeah. bridge burn? Um, well, we'll hear about that in uh, in a little bit. Don't want to get ahead of that story too far. Uh, yes, sir. How about the First Georgia Cavalry? Are they trying to protect the uh, movement of uh, hood down this way from these uh, 
Um, this guy's here? No, uh, well, no, um, not directly. The, the evening before, they had been sent out to establish a picket line, a skirmish line, across the rear of the Confederates who had moved southward in late afternoon. Um, and, and that's what they have done across the road there to the south of where we started out. Um, and, but that, having had contact um, late, late at night, about as late as midnight by some estimates, they um, now on the morning of the, um, uh, the 19th, they begin to probe forward to try to find out what it was they'd run into. Um, and this is going to spark um, a growing action out here. Anybody else? All right, um, I need to pass through you all, get to the edge of the road. Um, to please do not cross till I get over there and make sure we can do so safely. I gotta make sure I don't get my clipboard in front of it, otherwise it's gonna be bad. That's my big problem. Yeah, I, if, if I break down and try to use the one they gave me, I'm not gonna put it around my hand. I'm gonna, I'm gonna put it through on um, All right, I pause here um, because now that the the sun is up and we can see, um, it also will um, will allow me to uh, to go back as I said I would and describe the landscape or terrain here just a little bit um, better. Um, particularly, you all right there are standing in the woods just at the western edge of the uh, the Jay's Mill field. When the veterans came back to create. The, uh, the National Military Park in the late 1880s and early 1890s. They found the battlefield landscape um, increasingly changed by the greater density of people living here in the 1870s and 1880s. And so one of the things that the veterans wanted to do as they established the battlefield park was to restore the landscape to the way it was in 1863 as part of their purpose of creating this National Military Park as a giant outdoor classroom. How can you understand, as they said, some of the most remarkable maneuvers and brilliant fighting in the War of the Rebellion if you can't see the ground as it was um, at the time uh, it was hallowed by those actions on those September days. Here at Jay's Mill uh, area, this had become the forest post office, the forest community by the time of uh, the establishment of the National Military Park, named after Nathan Bedford Forest. This was the farm of the Peters family. Um, and the senior Peters had been involved in the Great Locomotive Chase. He'd been a Western Atlantic Railroad um, employee in 1862. They had cleared much more land out to the... Um, Thank you. They had cleared much more land out to the west of here. And so in this instance, the veterans had to start planting trees to get the field back to its proper size. To mark the historic alignment of the fields, they decided to erect limestone blocks um, at the corners. Now this is actually a replacement one. Um, the real one um, was destroyed, as so many of them have been, uh, by um, misdirected tractors um, uh, over the, uh, the years. But you now stand on the western edge of the Jays Mill field. And that, went, that line ran south down in this direction. We're going to try to move down in the, uh, that way our, ourselves. The um, uh, out in front of you would have been that uh, field of brush and stumps. And it is right along here where the skirmish line of Dan McCook's brigade had been during much of the night. 
But that morning, they had wheeled the skirmish line um, to the uh, to the south, and they are then facing um, uh, south. But this is the edge, western edge of the north-south um, uh, tall part of the backward L. So. Um, I don't think we'll be able to walk all the way along this um, this edge. Uh, be careful of your footing as we do. There are some stumps and stobs. Um, there's also a place, and this I think is what's going to prevent us from going very uh, too far. There's a place where there is some blackberry, um, and um, you know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> Cut. Um, railroad ties. They're not necessarily cut on all four sides, they're still only cut on two sides, um, but they are not hand-hewn any longer, which was the standard before the war. Um, not so much a standard because they thought there was something wrong with a sawn cut side, uh, tie, but it was the cost of using a piece of equipment um, to, uh, to cut uh, a tie versus um, having some guy with an ads um, square up, up two sides. So. Um, uh, it is seven miles too far to haul um, firewood. Took two cords of wood to go from uh, from Atlanta to Chattanooga on a train. Um, the uh, it probably is too far to haul firewood, but um, the Western Atlantic Railroad had just had to relocate um, or establish a new wood yard just south of Ringgold because all of the wood within reach of the previous one had been um, cut up. So, um, so. Uh, yeah, I'd like to know more about what um, William J. was doing, but um, haven't been able to solve those uh, those questions yet. He is a mystery to us. Yeah, he is a, so far it is a mystery, but I think it's pretty clear. Um, he is, um, uh, is timbering um, and creating lumber um, um, here uh, because of the description of stumps in this field. And then um, there are uh, treetops um, mentioned out to the west of us. Um, and then over by the Brockfield, there's a large area of felled timber um, that actually plays into the uh, action later on. I pause here. Indeed, the, uh, the blackberry um, uh, bramble began to, uh, to get denser. Um, just in the woods there, about the same distance um, back, um, if you measure from the edge of the woods right here, back to that marker where we last stood, that same distance, you'll find another one of those survey markers, um, a cluster of little flags. That's where the inside corner is, and then the field pushed out to the, um, to, to the west. The, um, the bottom part of the backwards L, um, and it is that part that was cultivated at the um, at the time. Um, but we are now here in um, um, the, uh, the the field, and just ahead of us is the spring, um, and perhaps a source of water. <laughs> 